Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. I'm here with International Master Anna Rudolph, chess player, announcer, reporter. What else, Anna? Uh, I don't know myself. I think it's just difficult to find the description for the jobs that exist nowadays uh, in the chess world and in general in the world. So I do a bit of everything, I guess. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on, Anna. I originally asked Anna to come on in January, and she, at the time mentioned that she was going to be pretty busy in January, which usually if I ask a guest that and they say they're busy, it means no thank you. But then, Anna, <laughs> but then Anna, you proceeded to be on every chess show that I could ever imagine in January. Every time I logged onto the internet, there you were. So you actually were really busy. Uh, yeah, I do tend to say the truth. Uh, I guess you mean that I was at the Tata Steel Chess Tournament, also streaming the Pro Chess League, which I'm still doing, of course. It's a really exciting month. The finals will be at the end of March. And in general, I'm quite busy. So, But I'm really glad that I could make it to your show. I have listened to several episodes, and I'm impressed by your work. So it's it's an honor for me to be here. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, so how did you get into announcing chess, Anna? Uh, good question. Uh, I was thinking the other day because I thought that you might ask me and maybe I should know the answer. Um, I started working for Chess24 four years ago. So the site was launched three years ago and we started working for for the company roughly a year before so that there would be content on the website when they launch it. And uh, actually that was like a horrific a horrific memory, the first recording days, this, the whole experience of being in front of the camera without having any experience of being in front of the camera. You can imagine, in, you're in the studio, it's a green box, and uh, you record yourself, basically. So there's no one around. Maybe it's better that no one is there, but still, you, you click on the record button, you start looking into the camera, and you try to say something smart, but you just black out. So I have had everything prepared. I always prepare everything. I try to write notes. I try to just somehow brainstorm what I'm going to say roughly. And I, I couldn't. The first recording days were just perhaps the, best, the worst experience of my life because I had no idea how this should work. And I was struggling. I was trying to repeat and repeat. And I still don't say it properly and repeat again. And it was in Spanish. So it wasn't even in my best language. I think my English is way better than my Spanish. So I was recording in Spanish first. And uh, horrible times. But uh, of course, uh, I I liked being there. I liked being in Hamburg. And uh, then I got to know Sopico. And once we started working together, it was just a way easier so that yeah, that's another story. But the beginnings were difficult, and uh, I was not born to be in front of the camera. I think no one is. It's the practice that makes you be a good uh, presenter, a good host, a good streamer. Okay. Well, I don't think anyone watching you now would know that. So, uh, when oh, you should watch my first videos. <laughs> if, if you go on Chess Twenty Four and watch the first videos I produced. They are horrible. <laughs> okay, maybe it'll be an inspiration for other people a little bit uncomfortable in terms of uh, public speaking, oh, which, I, which I think... Everything, every skill is possible to learn. So please remember that I was really bad. I was shy. I was blacking out all the time. I was like nervous, constantly stressing out. And here I am enjoying commentary. I love being in front of the camera. <laughs> Good for you. And how, how did you uh, latch on with Chess24? How did you um, start working with them even before they launched? I knew David Martinez. Uh, he is the director of the Spanish uh, part of Chess24. Uh, so we worked together before Chess24, and he knew that I'm supposed to be a hardworking person. So he, he hired me for Chess24, and initially I was going to record videos only in Spanish for beginner level. So my first videos are for the like how the pieces move how is the chessboard and sort of topics in spanish and okay. then uh, we were in hamburg the same time sopico and i she was recording in the mornings and i was recording in the afternoon and evening so we were sharing the studio but never really coinciding there 
Um, we knew each other before, like from tournaments. So we would say hi, but frankly speaking, we thought that we didn't like each other. Hmm. <laughs> and they told us, um, okay, girls, would you like to try to record together in English? And um, it sounded like a great idea, but, you know, you barely know the other person. And on top of that, you think that she doesn't like you. Uh, so we said yes. And we started talking to each other. And we realized that we were just so similar. We are like best friends ever since. We clicked from the first moment. The first videos we recorded are on Chess24. And they are way better than any other videos that we did alone. The Miss Strategy, Miss Tactics series. Uh, we recorded initially games by Kasparov and Karpov, just emphasizing the difference between the style of these two players. And uh, we didn't need much preparation for those videos. It just worked out perfectly from the very beginning. I don't know how. I guess it means that we are so much in sync, the two of us. And uh, as I said, we are best friends ever since. I can't wait to see her and uh, visit her lovely baby boy, Daniel. Nice. Yeah. And I, I think most listeners will, will know of Sapoko, but just in case, can you say her full name? And we should mention that she's a, a great yeah, chess player so in her own. Yeah, Go I ahead. I always take it for granted that everybody knows that uh, well, they, we are joined they, by the bones. Uh, it's uh, Sapoko Gramishvili the lovely wife of Anish Giri. Okay, and a great chess player in, in her own right. Yeah, she's really strong. She made it to the top 16 at the World uh, Women's Championship just now in Iran, and uh, she's she's very strong. I'm lucky that whenever we play, um, she she doesn't want to beat me. If not, <laughs> perhaps I would lose. <laughs> uh -huh. So do you guys have grandmaster draws when you play? Yeah, we can't really <laughs> play against each other. Uh, yeah, that's, We find it really difficult. That's understandable. Uh, so are you playing much these days? Uh, not anymore. Um, it's funny how I was thinking also the other day <laughs> that you will probably ask me about my career as a chess player. And I was very much focused on chess from, let's say, age 10, 11 till last year. I, I attended the Olympic training camps every month. I had a personal trainer and I was I was really motivated still last year. But uh, in the summer, I played a very bad tournament, the European Women's Championship, and then I was not selected for the Olympic team, which uh, sort of broke my final motivation. Right. Um, and I'm more focusing more on streaming, on commentating, on reporting. Uh, so I'm trying to improve those skills more than my own opening skills, which are really, really bad. <laughs> Well, well, your enthusiasm for chess, I think, definitely comes through both in your broadcasts and your Twitter feed and uh, everywhere else that uh, your pre uh, thank your you. presence I, is known. I still love chess, I, and I listened to your interview with Greg Shahadi, mm -hmm. and I completely agree with him that those people who stop competing, it doesn't mean that they, or in this case now, we don't love chess anymore. We just perhaps don't find the time to participate in a nine-day tournament or we find the games too long. Well, I still like classical games. I would not say that for myself, but uh, I do agree that it's difficult to find mo personal motivation for lengthy tournaments that take a, a week, especially when you work already. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I still like to play, but, um, you know, it's a hobby. So <laughs> there's only so much I can play. So when you're not, uh, when you're, you live in Madrid, correct? Yes, I do. I'm in Madrid right now, and the sun is shining, so I'm happy. Oh, yeah, sounds good to me. It's dreary here in Pittsburgh, um, which, oh, which is not unusual. <laughs> but <laughs> but, uh, but so uh, what do you do when you're not engaged in uh, like a chess project? What do you do in your day-to-day -day life there in Madrid? Oh, wow, good question, because most of the things I do are basically all the work I do is related to chess. So I'm a freelancer and I collaborate with Chess24, with Chess.com, with ChessCast and uh, also the Judith Polgar's Chess Foundation. Um, individual individual tournaments like the Tata Steel Chess Tournament, so I'm always happy when an individual event uh, approaches me and asks me to, to be their host, to be their reporter or commentator. And uh, that kind of takes all my time. So one good thing that I definitely have like a second career, but um, you would not imagine how much time it takes to be at all the major chess events and uh, yeah, to do chess nonstop. So when I'm in Madrid and I'm not streaming or I don't have a live show, I don't have an event to cover, I, I just try to take some time for improving my skills. 
I'm I'm constantly mad about going uh, ahead. I'm like, when I do a show or when I do commentary, an interview, I'm never hundred percent satisfied with what I do, and I want to do it the the I want to do it better the next day and the next day and the next day. So basically, when I'm home, when when I'm at home, I would watch like YouTube videos, TED talks. I would watch interviews. I would um, I would go to my yoga lessons and my Zumba lessons because it's not only about improving your presentation skills, your interviewing skills, but also I like to do physical exercise. Um, I cook sometimes, <laughs> which uh, which is um, kind of like my chess. I don't have a big repertoire in terms of like knowing recipes, mm-hmm. so I was never good at like opening theory. And I'm not good at knowing recipes, but I'm very creative. <laughs> and I, I just look in the fridge and see, okay, what do we have? And what would match with what? And uh, somehow it turns out quite delicious. I don't know how. <laughs> no, good for you. I have kind of the opposite approach. I, I'm, more, oh, really? <laughs> I'm more of a, th- a theoretician when it comes to cooking. I just, I just oh, follow no, the totally recipe. and the opposite. <laughs> and I very have... pragmatic, only practical issues. And uh, yeah, I'm, I was never good at, good at memorizing data. I can't memorize uh, numbers, uh, facts. I just, I'm just very practical and creative, I think. So in, in Madrid, am I correct that uh, you live with uh, your, is it boyfriend or husband that, or fiance? Boyfriend at the okay. moment, yes. Because uh, I read uh, you, um, you're, as we publish this, so there's also an interview with New in Chess, the wonderful chess magazine coming out in which you, you mentioned that uh, that you, you hoped that your wedding day would be a, a, a great memory. So I wasn't sure if it was coming up or you're just putting pressure on him. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting pressure on him. Okay. Well, uh, we've been together for three and, three and a half years and it's a very serious relationship. We live together, but I don't think that we are getting married right now. I just like to put pressure on him. Okay. That's the correct way to put it, yes. And, and he's, a, he's a chess player, correct? Yes, he's an international master. His rating is way higher than mine. I mean, he's 2450, but without doing anything. And for me, that's so frustrating. By, by not doing anything, I mean that uh, he, yeah, he sometimes he had some training sessions, but he never took it seriously. So for him, it was a hobby. And as a hobby player, he's higher rated than me. Right. <laughs> me, who put all her life on chess. So I think he's just much smarter than I am. That must be the reason. Well, yeah, maybe a better facility for chess, at least. I don't know if that means he's smarter generally, but I've certainly... Come- yeah, he's a, he's a very good competitor. Whatever he does, he's really good at competing. He used to play football professionally. He plays paddle now, like tennis and but whatever you can do with balls, like basketball even, just for hobby, he would do it. And is he the reason that you live in Madrid? He- Yes. Okay. Yeah, I moved to Spain before that, but right now we are living together in Madrid. Yes, and I love Spain. I love Spanish culture, Spanish music, um, the food, the yeah. weather, of course, and Spanish people, especially him. Yeah, I've never been to Madrid. I spent a few days in Barcelona, and I, I had the same impression. So. Oh, Barcelona is great. I think uh, as a tourist, I would suggest Barcelona. It's a lot nicer. I mean, in a way that it's much more special it's more unique i love gaudi's architecture i think i said that too in new in chess and um, barcelona is is just full of his architecture the casa Bahlo, casa mila the sagrada familia i'm sure you visited it and it's just for me when when i was standing inside the sagrada familia i could not imagine that this was possible for a church i mean that's a church that looks like not a church yeah. it's just it's just uh, such a wonderful Art, artwork and uh, Barcelona is, is a really unique place that if you walk on the, the streets, there's no place in the world that looks like that. So I would suggest Barcelona for tourists. And if you want to live in Spain, Madrid is a great place everywhere at our parks. I love that Madrid is actually one of the greenest capitals in the world. I think it's the second on the list. And it's true. There are par- parks everywhere, trees everywhere, and I just love nature. So I couldn't live in a big city without being surrounded by something green. Yeah, it sounds, you, you paint a pretty picture of it. I'd, I'd definitely like to, like to get there sometime. 
You should, you should. And also the beach in Spain, of course, and the island. So I generally recommend Spain. So you've already mentioned Judith Polgar a couple times. And obviously, since, yeah. you, since you grew up in Hungary, you're, in a sense, in, in the shadow of the, the Polgars. So could you, could you talk a little bit about what the, uh, what the chess culture was like and um, what it's been like to, to work with Judith a little bit? Oh sure, it's it's amazing, and of course I I love talking about Judy because she is an extraordinary person. Um, going back in time when I was a child, of course I looked up at all these Hungarian legends, starting with Lajos Portis um, and uh, Peter Leko, Judith Polgar, Zoltan Almasi. I met them at Simons. Uh, I played against Lajos Portis when I was nine, uh, and I beat him. Oh nice! And I remember that he was furious. Because he thought that my dad was helping me. He couldn't believe that a nine-year-old girl would beat him. So, I mean, I, I don't think that um, he played perfectly against me. I don't think that he was focusing much on my game because, come on, it's just a nine-year-old little girl. So, for sure, he didn't take that game too seriously, and that's why I won. But still, I just, <laughs> that was my, maybe my highlight in terms of um, games against these Hungarian legends. Most of the time, I, I would just lose. Uh, I played later on, I think, maybe with Almashi. I can't recall it exactly, but um, this was the highlight of my simuls. And I have a signature from all of them. I was, I was really admiring them. And in 2008, I won the Hungarian Women's Championship for the first time. And with the first prize, you also got into the Olympic team, which for me was a huge step from being a cheerleader fan type of girl to actually being a teammate of these legends. So Peter Leko was there, Judith Poga was there, Zoltan Almaji was there. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm having dinner with them. <laughs> So, yeah, from being a fan, I suddenly became their teammate and soon we, we developed a very friendly relation uh, and friends with most of them. And with Judith especially, we have a, a very close relation working and also I, I, I think we are friends. I'm not sure that uh, uh, if she thinks of me the same way, we are, we are not besties, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I love her. She's a great person, and often we have Skype conversations. Judith, uh, Sophia, her sister, and myself, we are brainstorming ideas about her projects, the Global Chess Festival, where I was helping her, and still this is an ongoing project. So we do talk a lot and uh, very often. <laughs> Well, um, that, that must be, uh, quite a, quite a privilege. So in, in exactly what capacity have you worked with her professionally? It started last summer when I actually started working, um, on her project on the Global Chess Festival. Before that, we were colleagues in a Hungarian TV show. Um, I think this is a really cool stuff when you can put chess on TV. But uh, it wasn't so successful. So, of course, we loved the idea of trying to create a chess TV program. Uh, Judith had a segment in it. I had another segment. Uh, we did it for, for a year. So it was a season on Hungarian National Channel. And uh, from that moment on, of course, we, we talked even more. Um, once the TV show was over, we started uh, discussing uh, her chess festival, which is a yearly chess festival on um, her chess festival started 10 years ago. Uh, it was a chess festival. Basically, it was a chess day for the three Polgar sisters. It was a day when the three sisters would get together and play a simul. You could take pictures with them, ask for their autograph. Since the three of them live in three different countries, it was um, quite a big thing for Hungarians that they can finally see the three sisters together back again. But uh, through the years, it has developed into a worldwide festival. And uh, of course, it's still built around Judith, but she wants she wants it to be a wider message. And actually, the slogan is chess connects us, which I think is a is a great message. And it it basically wants to reflect that chess is a lot more than a board game. It's something that 
can actually unite people from different age groups, from different gender, from different uh, countries, cultures, religion, language. It's a bridge between people who might not have anything else in common. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that that appeals to me about chess and that I enjoy uh, with doing this podcast, just getting to hear little glimpses into different cultures that have to have to do with chess, but also touch on just life generally in different places. And I know that you've learned, how many languages do you speak, Anna? I don't know how many I speak. I know how many I tried to speak. It started. Started with, uh, of course, English. That was my first foreign language. I also then studied German for four years. At the university, I studied uh, Russian philology, and at the same time, I tried to study Finnish for a year, Finnish language. Then I started studying Spanish, and I still speak Spanish, luckily, <laughs> since I live here. And I think I'm just a language fan in general. So. I would try to learn a few words in in any language where I am. For instance, I remember that I was playing the the Greek league. I was I think 16. So I missed my flight and I was stuck at the airport of Athens for like 7 hours at night. And I had to stay awake because I was alone. So I decided that perhaps it was a good idea to learn the Greek alphabet. Huh. And and I just took a magazine that I found at the airport and started copying the letters and try to figure out what is what since it had an English translation uh, I thought that it's not too bad and uh, and yeah I think by the end of those seven hours waiting for my flight I I actually knew how the Greek alphabet worked you you Europeans make us Americans look so bad when you speak so many languages oh don't think that <laughs> for instance Spanish people don't really speak other languages much or like French people I mean I don't want to of course, uh, apologies to any Spanish or French who speak many languages. But I know also a couple of people when I travel and when you would go to a restaurant or a hotel and they don't speak to you in any other language besides their native language. So that's it's I don't think that Euro we Europeans are a lot better at languages. Well, you you work harder at it, if not innately better at it. I think Hungarians are forced to. I mean, what can you do with Hungarian language skills? Yeah. Sad, but probably true. Uh, so getting back to Hungary a little bit. So you, you started playing chess very young uh, and were uh, a young talent, according to my research. Um, so I was just, I, it might be hard for you to compare across countries, but do you have a sense of how popular chess was in Hungary compared to other places and is? I mean, you mentioned the legendary players, but were there school programs uh, for chess? Um, I think... Uh we do have a lot of chess tradition in Hungary. I don't know if it helped us, the young players, to become better. Perhaps yes, because we had role models. You are right that we had all these legends to look up at. We would also see them in person. So it wasn't like some far away hero that we had, but we, we actually saw them in flesh and we could, perhaps we were inspired by, by actually meeting these players in person. Also, I remember I was studying from Portish's Endgame book one summer because I felt like, okay, I, he's he's a person I met. I played against him in a simul, and he's got a great book, so why not study his book? Perhaps it's easier when there's such trusted chess tradition and uh, that many chess clubs. And um, nowadays, I think it's getting more popular in, in every country, basically, luckily, thanks to the Chess in Schools project. So I'm, I'm really rooting for chess to be even more popular, not only for mm, trying to be a chess professional. I mean chess as an educational tool for improving the academic skills of children. Yeah, I, I believe in, in it as well, and I, I hope that most, most people who work in chess education and chess announcing and chess promoting uh, believe in it or else they shouldn't do it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think so. I think it, I think it's uh, it really has a good future. I see it uh, being implemented in in many countries here around. In it's already in the curriculum in Hungary, also in Spain. Uh, more and more schools are taking it uh, into their regular lessons. So I was before Chess Twenty Four. I actually worked at a school where where chess is a subject. It's a school here in Madrid, nearby Madrid, and I was teaching in kindergarten. 
uh, so that the children, the five-year-olds, would know how the pieces move by the time they are in primary school. Because in primary school, they get notes. They, they do have exams on May Team 1, for instance. So it's, uh, it's, it was cool to see that they do this, um, that it's part of the, uh, the school curriculum. Yeah, I, I know that chess.com has been doing some, and chess kid have been doing some promotion work trying to get it passed more. Here in the United States, chess is, like you said, it's getting more popular, but, uh, there's a lot of testing. So it's unfortunately a, a long bridge to cross to get them to actually have you have it accepted in the curriculum versus having mm -hmm. after school programs and stuff like that. But we're I working on it. I think it would it. be great. It, it just has so many, so many advantages and benefits for the children that I would really recommend every school to have it. Um, I don't know if it should be obligatory, but if it's in just the extra curriculum, you should really promote it so that the parents realize that it has lots of benefits. If not, it would be just typical geek sport. <laughs> Yeah, I think Nazi Pekutsi said that in Georgia it's an elective, so there's, it is in the curriculum, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like you have to do it. And I think that's a good setup. Uh, yes, I would, I would also go for that if I was a school director. Yeah, and not to get too far off topic, but with what's happening with like the automation of jobs and stuff like that, um, with uh, robots taking over the world. Uh, yeah, oh my, <laughs> it's scary. Yeah, but counterintuitively, I think that chess is actually a, a better educational tool in light of that because it teaches dynamic thinking. And yes, we don't exactly. Yeah, that's what uh, Judith is also doing. Besides the chess festival, she has a, a program called Chess Palace. And what they do is that they use chess as a tool. So she is emphasizing that the ultimate goal of the course is not that the children learn how to play chess. They use chess as a tool to improve academic skills. And I think that's just wonderful when you can actually uh, do something great through chess in a digital age when all the kids' eyes are glued to the screen, the tablets, smartphones, and so on. I, I do that myself, but I try to hide my phone from time to time because it's addictive. Yeah, it's a constant struggle. I'm, I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> you are the, the second woman guest I've had on the podcast. I've tried to have a few more. I'm a, I'm a feminist, I think it's safe to say, and I'm... I'm <laughs> I hope that, you know, I'm one of the many people that wishes that uh, more girls and women would pursue chess. Do you, do you have any uh, advice to young girls or ideas for, for how we can, we can help to um, uh, level the gender imbalance in chess? Um, it's a difficult question. Of course, I, I would love to see more girls participating. And I hope that with uh, with my presence and also Sopico and all the other uh, great show hosts and commentators that are there among the women players, I hope that we also encourage girls to take up chess just by being on the screen and they see us and they see that, oh, there's a girl who also plays chess and she talks about chess and she thinks that chess is cool. And so it's not a nerdy game. It's also for girls. I hope that we are we are actually projecting this message. And uh, I, I really root for girls to take up chess. Makes you smarter. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I agree. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think you guys do a great job. Uh, there's. Thank you. There's something you know. I teach a lot of, as you mentioned, like primary schools. I teach a lot of young kids, and it's it's interesting to me that even if you just send letters home like mm -hmm. kids who know nothing about chess it's always more boys that sign up so i don't i don't know yeah. exactly what the source is but uh it starts at a young age yes i think it's the image of chess it it really still is a man's world the chess world and uh it will take time to change this but i hope that we are going in the right direction yeah i i think that we are and and growing up as a a girl playing chess in Hungary and traveling for international competitions and such, how, how were you treated as a girl and now a woman uh, in what uh, unfortunately is a men's world? Um, I was always very welcomed at every place that I visited. Maybe the only difference I felt was that people would remember me like, for instance, let's say you are at a tournament in France 
and somebody comes up to you and he tells you, oh, hi, Anna, do you remember we played the same tournament two years ago in Italy? And I'm like, uh, huh. n- no clue. Right. So being a female player, what I realized is that people remember you <laughs> and you might not remember them because you are perhaps a 10%, 5%, 2% of the whole field, um, the women players. So, yeah, that's the only difference I realized. Besides that, um, no discrimination. Um, I never felt uh, being a, a minority, actually. Even if it's true that the numbers show that you are a small percentage of the whole field, I never felt like a minority. Well, that's good to hear. I, I do know some women chess players whose experience hasn't been as a... Uh, um a hundred percent positive, but but I'm glad to hear that that yours was, and I hope that that's also encouraging to any uh, girls or young women uh, listening and you know thinking about getting into chess. Yeah, they should definitely do that, and uh, I think uh, as I said, chess is cool, and it's really something that. If you like chess, you can like it no matter how old are you, no matter if you are a girl, a boy, a grandma or a grandpa. You can take up chess at any age. Just try it and see if you like it. And if you don't like it, don't play chess. I mean, uh, I'm not trying to make the whole world play, be a chess player or know how to play chess. Simply have a go at it and don't have these uh, stereotypes in your head that this is something for weird boys who are not social. <laughs> Although they do, they do t- tend to like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some some might be like the stereotypical chess player, but I think most of the people are not like that at all. So this stereotype too should be. Uh, demolished it's just not true anymore yeah. just look at the world champion magnus carlsen <laughs> no it's true and I, I do think it's changed over over at least my lifetime i mean I, I just looking at the people who are at tournaments when i was a kid i feel that they were a little bit more eccentric than the i mean you still have your eccentrics but i think the percentage has gone down mm-hmm. um so that's definitely a positive development so, uh, now, uh, you've been doing a lot of announcing. Do you have any, um, I mean, and you're busy with the Pro Chess League. We should talk about that. But I'm also wondering if you have any uh, other gigs coming up. Right now, the Pro Chess League is what takes up most of my time. And uh, March is is huge. It's all about Pro Chess League. Um, since we will know who will be the winner. And uh, I think you talked about the Pro Chess League with Greg already. But I just wanted to add that I love his idea. And I think that this is a way to make chess more popular because what we are suffering with is that uh, classical games and classical tournaments are not engaging enough for a general audience. You can't put it on TV because nobody would watch a five-hour stream of five chess games for nine days. It's just not possible. And so I really like that Greg and uh, Danny Range, chess.com, they try to do something that is different so uh, it makes this Pro Chess League an eSport. But at the same time, this is basically what people are into nowadays, and this is the future. So it's great that from the traditional chess tournaments, we also start to launch into something that is actually the future. So I love classical tournaments as a player, but as a promoter of chess, a streamer, show host, whatever I'm called, I do believe that they are right that uh, a classical tournament with classical time control, classical everything, classical, traditional is not good enough for capturing the public. It's not good for people who, who might like it if we could present chess in a more visual, in a more entertaining way. So... The Pro Chess League, shout out to the Pro Chess League, is one such idea how it could be better. How, of course, it's not to replace the World Championship, it's not to replace the Olympiads and all the other major super tournaments, but it's great to have new innovative ways of a chess competition that could capture the audience in a better way. Yeah. And so the Pro Chess League is great. <laughs> I'm going to host it with Lawrence Trent on Wednesday once again, the Central Division. And uh, I also did the predictions. I- I'm so bad at it. So I have 50% so far. I guess the the winners of the matches, uh, only four of the eight matches. 
Uh, I hope I guess the winner at least, but I, I don't want to say it yet. Who who is my pick for the overall winner of the Pro Chess League? Yeah, well, I, one thing I just want to mention is that the numbers have been really good for the Pro Chess League. So hopefully this is only the beginning. I, when I talk, to yes, them, and it's the first season, so receiving this much attention, the world's best players playing, tweeting, blogging about what they are doing in the Pro Chess League is huge. And uh, also, it's not only us, the official show hosts that are streaming about the Pro Chess League, but many teams have their own streams. And how cool is that? I mean, how cool is that you see all these other fans or team members actually recording their Pro Chess League experience? So it becomes really a worldwide chess celebration yeah i i really enjoy it even unfortunately even with the uh it not being classical chess i i only get to watch for a few hours on wednesdays but i do enjoy it when i can um so which match are you announcing wednesday who's playing who uh wednesday we will see the the marseille migrants versus the london lions oh, and wow. also the stockholm snowballs versus the uh, london towers i okay. was actually struggling to remember because up until the last minute of the stream with Lawrence, we were announcing the other two teams, the Khan Blockbusters and the Amsterdam Mosquitoes as the winners. I mean, they were just winning from winning the match and from uh, actually knocking out the other teams, the, the two London teams. So this playoff system is just so dramatic. And I don't know how, but the two English teams came back came back from the tomb, literally, huh. because <laughs> they had to score more points from the uh, inferior positions. They were like a pawn down, exchange down. I don't know what else we saw, hanging rooks on the board and all sorts of crazy stuff that doesn't happen often. And they turned everything around and somehow they qualified so it was really really a dramatic experience i i posted about it on my facebook because i i still can't believe what happened so if you guys missed it uh you can check it on my facebook page there's a link to the stream the last half an hour could be the most shocking chest experience you will ever see in terms of team competition okay i'll, I'll actually have to check it out myself so is your facebook <laughs> page open to any fans of yours or is it like uh for your friends only sort of thing i have a profile but i barely updated what i do on facebook is uh, my facebook page so it's called anna rudolph's chess page and you can follow me there i think yeah i think you can like the page and then you get updates i'm very active there and uh, also on twitter at anna chess is my handle and uh, i tweet often <laughs> also i retweet often i have instagram as well but i i'm i barely use it yet i hope i will get to it more everybody tells me it's important uh, but so far it's facebook and twitter mainly i tweet but facebook i like that i can actually write more than just a few characters the tweets are just sometimes too short for me yeah makes sense um and check for the interview in, in New in Chess. I thought that it was a, a nice little window into your day-to-day -day life. So you, you mentioned a couple of books that you're reading. Are you, do you like to read? I do. I do. I, I'm still reading the same book that I, I said in New in Chess, 11 by Mark Watson. Actually, I didn't know this author, but I found the, the description of the book interesting. So I bought it before I, I read uh, the uh, Dan Brown books, of course, I read uh, the Central Trilogy. Um, what else I read recently? I usually read things like with <laughs> a delay. I somehow watch movies later. I read books later. I'm not up to date. I don't know what the trends are, but I do like to read. And um, also on YouTube, I would recommend... Uh, I, I watch not TV, but YouTube. So that's why I'm talking about YouTube all the time. I love the TED Talks. I would tell everybody to watch TED Talks um, because you can learn so much from those speakers. I think that um, we are all gifted in something and uh, you should find your passion. You should find what you are passionate about and do that if you can as, a, as a, a way of living or if you can't give up your work, then do it in your free time. But we are all good at something. And those speakers at the TED Talks do prove that to me all the time that I learn something new with each and every talk. So if you 
just uh, look for a TED talk on a topic that you like. And uh, I think that's just a great way of learning. I feel like nowadays, instead of going to university, I did go to university. I'm not, I'm not against uh, the school system, but you can learn every day from using the internet, not only for surfing on Facebook and checking Instagram photos, but using, for instance, YouTube in a smart way and uh, typing in something that you are into. For instance, I would type in presentation skills. Um, I would type in, I don't know, even I even learned how to do my makeup from YouTube, huh. which uh, maybe most of the listeners are not into. But all I want to say is that you can learn anything from YouTube. So anything that you are into, um, I don't know, I fix things at home because I type in, in YouTube how to fix your microwave and then you find it. So anything that you need, I think the Internet is a great library for that. Um, do you have a favorite TED Talk that comes to mind? Oof, uh, I'm very bad at remembering facts, so I, I can't tell you the names, but okay. I, I do share talks from time to time. So if you see something on my Facebook, that means that I liked it. Also, I like uh, talk shows, American talk shows. I like the late show, the late, late shows. I love uh, James Corden. I wrote that I would invite him for dinner in the New in Chess profile. But I also like, for instance, Jimmy Kimmel, uh, Seth Meyer. Uh, I think they're just hilarious. So it sounds like you're watching these shows in English. When you read, what language do you generally read in? English. Wow. Almost always English. Yep. I barely do anything in Hungarian, and I think that reflects um, why my Hungarian is so bad. Um, when I go to Hungary and when I talk to my family, they always tell me that, Anna, you have an accent. <laughs> uh, I always say that I think I don't speak any language properly because I have a mix in my head. I try to switch between three languages constantly being uh, English, Spanish, Hungarian, and from time to time try to understand German and Russian. And this causes such a mess in my head. I appreciate the people who can actually keep up with all the languages they speak. Uh, I don't do that anymore. I used to have a Londoner accent. I lived in London for a year. And when I went back to university, everybody told me that, oh, Anna, you have such a Londoner accent. And I was like, oh, my, that's great. And also, also the people living in London, uh, native speakers, they didn't know where I was from, but they thought that I was from somewhere around. So I took that as a as a great compliment, like, oh, I sound like a native speaker. And I know that I don't sound like a native speaker anymore because I speak Spanglish, I speak weird English, I speak weird Hungarian, and I'm confused. <laughs> well, I can't judge your Spanish, but you speak English perfect, perfectly fine as far as I'm concerned. I mean, thank you. I do read and listen in English all the time, also on purpose, because uh, this is my work language. And as I said, I always believe that you should improve your skills no matter what. So with every day, I want to be a better speaker. That also means that I, I want to improve my English every day. So even now, I would look up words in the dictionary. I think it's never too late to learn. I don't think that I speak bad, uh, but I want to keep it up at the same level or raise the level. So always go forward, never backward. Nice. With whatever skills you want to improve. I feel like this is a, this is like a TED Talk in its own right. <laughs> your, your oh, thank own, you. Maybe maybe that I watch too much TED Talks. Inspiring our audience, I'm sure. Um, well, I can't think of any other questions, Anna. Is there anything else you wanna uh, you wanna mention before we uh, let you go? I think that has been it. It was a pleasure to be here. As I said before, I really appreciate your work and. Uh, I think that all the episodes I listened to were super interesting. I learned something new with each of them. I still have to listen to plenty others, but whenever I can, I will listen to your podcast. Also, shout out to the Full English Breakfast. I'm happy that they restarted their shows. I listened to them back then in 2010, I think, when they were producing regular podcasts. So I'm happy that now there's more chess material also in audio because everything nowadays is becoming too visual and podcasts are still needed for the moments when you actually want to focus on the words and not on what you see. So sometimes visuals can be distracting.
Yeah, I'm pretty excited that they're back, too. Part of the reason I made this podcast was it was just kind of driving me crazy that there one didn't exist. And I'm sure you can relate that when I produce these, by the time they come out, I don't really want to listen to the podcast that I make. So <laughs> so even though I, cr- I help create these, uh, I don't actually listen to them once they're out. So now I have a chess podcast that I can listen to when I'm driving <laughs> around, which was the original goal. So. I'm, I'm excited yeah, I, I know well. how it feels. I know what you mean. It's just always weird to listen to yourself. Though I do listen to myself to find mistakes and improve. Yeah, <laughs> I, I sh- always try to improve my mistakes. I should probably do that, but, <laughs> but uh, not not currently. <laughs> um, okay, well, and I think we already touched on how people can reach you. So uh, I, I just want to thank you again for coming on, and uh, good luck with all your projects. Thank you. The same to you. Okay. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. To hear more episodes, give feedback, or suggest guests, go to perpetualchesspod.com. If you like the show, please help me out by telling your friends and giving me a high rating on iTunes. I'll be back next week with another episode of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess.